Hello, good morning, and welcome to An Academy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. Before we initiate today's discussion, I have two very important announcements to make. Number one, on the 27th of January 2024, Saturday at 7 p.m., we are organizing a big workshop to help the civil services aspirants. Should you wish to attend that workshop, I urge all of you to attend that workshop. The link to register for that workshop is provided in the comment section. That's number one. Number two, next week, two of India's biggest English medium educators are joining me on this platform. One is an expert in economics. The other is an expert in international relations, internal security, and current affairs. And I can't wait to welcome these two individuals on this platform, which reiterates our promise of making an academy a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. By now, I think you may have guessed who these two top class educators are, and your guess seems to be as good as mine. Let me know what are your guesses in the comment section, and let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu Newspaper. These are the topics that we shall be discussing today, along with the page number and the relevance. And first up, a newspaper article on page number one of the Delhi edition of The Hindu Newspaper. Supreme Court rejects 11 Bilkis case convicts, their plea for more time to surrender. Let me give you the brief background of this case. Year was 2002. Bilkis Banu, then 21 year old, she was five months pregnant as well. She was gang raped. Almost her entire family was killed right in front of her. Over a period of time, she identified the accused. The matter was investigated by the Gujarat police. But then Bilkis Banu approached the Supreme Court and asked for a CBI investigation into this case. And later, this case was also transferred to Maharashtra. To ensure free and fair investigation and trial, this case was taken up by the Central Bureau of Investigation and this trial was transferred to the state of Maharashtra. The year was 2008. 11 accused were convicted and they were sentenced to life imprisonment. The life imprisonment was upheld by the High Court as well, later on by the Supreme Court as well. But something else happened. The year was 2017. Bilkis Banu approached the Supreme Court for compensation. And the Supreme Court awarded 50 lakh compensation to Bilkis Banu, also directed the government to provide government job and government accommodation to Bilkis Banu. These 11 convicted, they were serving life imprisonment in Gujarat jail. And ultimately, they asked for remission. Once you have served some portion of your imprisonment of your term in the jail, then there is also an option of remission. Remission basically means a reduction of the jail term. 11 accused, 11 convicted, one of them approached and asked for remission. I have already served more than 15 years in jail. Now please reduce my jail term. This has to be decided by jail authorities. And these terms of remission vary from state to state. Why? Because you need to understand that prison 
is under state list in the distribution of powers under seventh schedule of the constitution prison comes under state list and in gujarat there was a remission policy of 1992 and then there is a remission policy of 2014 listen to me carefully 11 convicts serving their life imprisonment approaching the jail authorities Please reduce the jail term. Now, this has to be decided according to the remission norms, remission rules that exist in the state. In Gujarat, there used to be a policy of 1992 under which if there is a convicted individual who has served 14 years in jail, if you are serving life imprisonment and you have served 14 years of that life imprisonment, then under this policy, you are eligible for release. That means your term can be reduced. And under this 1992 policy, anybody could have been released. Whether you have committed heinous crime or any other crime, anybody who has served more than 14 years in jail, based on the recommendation of the jail authority, you can be released from the jail. This policy was invalidated by the Supreme Court in the year 2013 saying this policy is invalidated why because you have to segregate prisoners you have to segregate convicts based on the crimes that they have committed there are some crimes which affect the conscience of the people such individuals who are convicted for these crimes they should not be released and then in the year 2014 based on the directions of the supreme court the government in Gujarat modified this policy, created a new policy, new remission policy in 2014. According to this policy, no remission can take place for somebody who has been convicted for a crime and that crime has been investigated by the Central Bureau of Investigation. No remission can take place for somebody who has committed murder along with rape or gang rape. That means now, on the directions of the Supreme Court, a new remission policy started in 2014, according to which, if you are convicted for a crime, which has been investigated by the CBI, no remission. If you are convicted for a crime of murder, along with rape or gang rape, no remission. But when was this policy created? 2014. The Bilkis Banu incident happened in the year 2002. So all these 11 convicts, what will happen to them? Will they come under 1992 policy, which was existing at the time the crime was committed? Or will they come under 2014 policy? Gansham Das, one of the accused, one of the convicted, approached the prison authorities, later on approached the Supreme Court as well. And Supreme Court last year, in 2023, asked the Gujarat government that you should consider these convicts under 1992 policy. Why? Because this was the policy in existence at the time of the commission of the crime. This was the policy in existence at the time these individuals were sentenced as well. The last year, Bilkis Banu approached the Supreme Court challenging the release of these convicts because these convicts were later on released their sentence was remitted remission was carried out they were released in fact they were garlanded with flowers as well after their release which raised a hue and cry in the society how can the gang rape perpetrators be garlanded with flowers after their release and now this year the supreme court said this Supreme Court order last year, this was extracted by the accused through fraud, through concealment of facts, through misrepresentation. Why? There are two, three things important for you to understand. Number one, where was the crime committed? The crime was committed in Gujarat. But where did the trial happen? Where did the sentencing happen? 
it happened in Maharashtra. Where were these convicted prisoners imprisoned? In Gujarat. So who should decide whether remission should take place or not? Is it the Gujarat government where the crime was committed? Is it the Gujarat government where these convicted individuals are imprisoned? Or is it the Maharashtra government where the trial took place, where the sentencing took place? Criminal procedure code is clear. Which government has the jurisdiction when it comes to remission? That government where the sentencing took place, which means criminal procedure code is clear. That in this case, the decision to release, to remit the sentence of these convicted individuals, this power is with the Maharashtra government and not with the Gujarat government. And that is exactly what Supreme Court said in January 2024, wherein Supreme Court said that this power to remit the sentence should be given to Maharashtra government and not the Gujarat government. And basically, Supreme Court castigated the Gujarat government. You should have appealed against this Supreme Court order. When our judges said that you should consider 1992 policy and Gujarat government can order their release, the Gujarat state should have filed a review petition because that is not the power of the Gujarat government. That's the jurisdiction of the Maharashtra government. There was another anomaly. Whenever remission has to take place, you have to include the presiding judge of the court which has given sentencing, which has granted the sentence. That means in this case, the jail authorities had to consult the judge who was presiding, a Mumbai court. His recommendation was important before ordering the release of these convicted individuals. All these norms were violated and now the Supreme Court has said, all these individuals, convicted individuals who were released after their sentence was remitted, they have to now surrender before the court again. Later on, these convicted individuals approach the Supreme Court again asking for more time to surrender. But the Supreme Court has rejected saying no more time, you have to surrender ASAP or within two weeks. But the larger issue is, can these 11 individuals, 11 convicted individuals be still released? Yes. How? If the governor or the president decides to use their pardoning powers under Article 72, under Article 161 of the Constitution, because at any point in time, the president on the advice of the Council of Ministers cabinet, the governor on the advice of the cabinet can pardon any convicted individual. That's the only hope for these convicted individuals. And that is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Clear? Let's look at another important article. Abandon the idea of one nation, one election. Mr. Kharge tells the panel. Prime Minister Modi's pet project one nation, one election, or simultaneous elections. Election Commission of India is also in agreement with this idea of one nation, one election. The government has set up a panel headed by former President of India, Mr. Ramnath Kovind, to look into the feasibility of holding simultaneous elections in this country. Constitutional expert Subhash Kashyap is also part of this panel. Gulam Nabi Azad, the former Leader of opposition in Rajya Sabha is also a member of this panel. Mr. N. K. Singh is also a member, although these names are not important. But what is this idea of simultaneous elections? Election to Lok Sabha and legislative assemblies in all states should be conducted simultaneously at the same time. There are strong arguments in favor of one nation, one election. There are strong arguments, equal arguments, opposing this idea of one nation, one election. But for that, let's look at the arguments in favor of simultaneous elections, and then we will look at the arguments against the simultaneous elections. But you need to understand, this idea is not something new. In fact, from the time the country became independent, when the elections were conducted for the first time in the 1950s, 
till about early 1970s, there used to be simultaneous elections conducted in India. That means to Lok Sabha as well as state legislative assemblies, elections used to be conducted simultaneously. But then in 1971, Lok Sabha was dissolved prematurely. The then Prime Minister recommended, advised the President to dissolve Lok Sabha even before completing the five-year term, which necessitated the Lok Sabha elections, early Lok Sabha election. That means the cycle of simultaneous elections broke. Also, because of the blatant misuse, overuse, abuse, hyperuse of Article 356 of the Constitution, where the president can dismiss the state government. When the state governments were dismissed, which basically means their tenure got separated, ultimately the idea of simultaneous elections collapsed in India. But what are the arguments in favor of simultaneous elections? Number one is model code of conduct. As soon as the election dates are announced, till the declaration of results, model code of conduct comes into the picture. And during model code of conduct, no new schemes can be launched. No new policy decisions can be taken. The entire administration is under the grip of the Election Commission of India. Even if there is a natural disaster, to provide compensation to the victims of the natural disaster, the government has to seek the permission of the Election Commission of India. So the entire governance takes some sort of a full stop when it comes to the elections as soon as the dates are announced, when model code of conduct comes into the picture. And we are in the cycle of continuous elections. Lok Sabha elections in 2019, then elections in Delhi, then elections in Maharashtra, elections in Jharkhand, elections in various states. Recently, we saw elections to five states. Now we will see elections uh, to the 2024 Lok Sabha elections, then elections to Delhi, Jharkhand, Maharashtra. This cycle continues as if we are in a continuous cycle of elections. And this model code of conduct, which puts some sort of a break on the governance, we will see only once model code of conduct will come into picture if elections are held simultaneously. So for the remaining time, the government can focus on governance. That's why we should have simultaneous elections. Second, teachers are being used for election duty. Teachers, government employees, they are trained by the election commission officials to carry out elections in the states, at the Lok Sabha as well, which basically means if lakhs and lakhs of teachers are used for election duty during polling, then during counting as well, it will affect the quality of education as well. Let's have simultaneous elections so that only once we can utilize their services, not multiple times. Third, it saves money. The amount of expenditure involving elections in India, why can't we do it only once in five years and not spend money continuously? When Lok Sabha elections are conducted, the expenditure is borne by the central government. When the state elections are conducted, the, ele the expenditure is borne by the state government. But when simultaneous elections will be conducted, then in that scenario, the expenditure will be shared, which means center as well as states will be able to save a lot of money. And this money can be used for various social sector initiatives, for various welfare programs, for the downtrodden, weaker, marginalized sections of the society. That's why we need a simultaneous elections. Security forces, they are in a continuous cycle of elections. CRPF personnel, for example, they travel from one state to another state on election duties. Ultimately, they are fatigued as well. Why can't we ensure that their services for election duty is utilized only once so that for the remaining part of the year, they can focus on internal security? And we will give them a sense of fatigueless working environment. So for the sake of our security forces, let's have simultaneous elections. Frequent elections also disrupt normal life. 
there are rallies organized by political parties and their candidates which affect the normal life there are traffic jams uh, and ultimately we can have it only once in five years also frequent elections as soon as the elections are announced or there is a start of the election cycle unfortunately in india we see conflicts surrounding castes surrounding religion and since elections are held almost every year in multiple states in india we are in a continuous vicious cycle of caste and religious polarization unfortunately if we are having simultaneous elections we will still see such conflicts but only for a specific point of time for the remaining part of the four and a half years the government the people can focus on their daily tasks ministers can focus on governance instead of traveling from state to state for election campaigning ministers they should ideally clear the files which are pending for the long time but instead you see them hopping from states to states canvassing for votes and at the same time law commission of india had said that there is voter fatigue as well frequent elections sees a reduction in the polling percentage if we want to deepen democracy if we want to encourage the participation of people in the democratic exercise let's have elections once and we will see the voter participation will also go up these are the arguments in favor but then there are others who criticize this idea of simultaneous elections on these grounds saying what is the possibility possibility in the sense let's suppose 2024 simultaneous elections are conducted clear and let's suppose at lok sabha we have a majority government a government which has the majority on its own a stable government but what if there are 10 states where no political party is in a position to form the government on its own what will happen to these 10 states fresh elections are to be conducted then how can we ensure simultaneous elections or forget about that recent elections were conducted in telangana we have a new government in rajasthan chhattisgarh madhya pradesh in uh, mizoram we have a different government if simultaneous elections are to be conducted the term for these legislative assemblies is five years so in 2024 should we dissolve all these state legislatures even before they complete their tenure despite the fact that the chief ministers and the council of ministers they command majority on the floor of the legislative assembly so the problem with simultaneous elections the idea is it's an idea worth discussing but not the idea worth implementing because the possibility is less second it has an impact on voting behavior people vote for national elections general elections lok sabha elections differently keeping in mind national issues foreign policy diplomacy uh, the bigger challenges the economic policies but in the states they focus and they vote on local issues corruption day-to-day -day activities the problems associated with police the relief provided by the state government so on local issues whether we have roads or connectivity or not if elections are held simultaneously to both Lok Sabha as well as legislative assemblies, the national issues will dominate over local issues, which means national political parties will be at an advantage as against state political parties. That is why regional political parties are against the idea of simultaneous elections because they fear that they will lose these elections. They will lose the advantage to national political parties which affects federalism and it is no wonder once the cycle of simultaneous elections got broken in india in the 1970s you just look at the history and see after that we saw the emergence of various regional political parties so regional political parties owe their respect owe their existence owe their continued existence to frequent elections not simultaneous elections because with simultaneous elections national political parties will be at the advantage reduces accountability frequent elections at least the prime minister and the ministers 
they visit voters regularly asking for votes frequent elections means frequent interactions of the elected representatives with the people the central government under the bjp the bjp ministers and the prime minister will travel to different states and ultimately the people will hold them accountable if elections are held simultaneously we will see that voters will be unable to hold at least the central government accountable periodically so there should be periodic elections and not simultaneous elections it affects job creation frequent elections means frequent advertisements in the newspapers frequent elections means frequent publishing of the pamphlets the manifestos of the holdings of the billboards and this election machinery is a big industry as well so printing presses the rally restaurant owners daba walas they earn a lot of money because of these rallies and election propaganda frequent elections means frequent job creation as well which reminds me of the argument given by former chief election commissioner dr s y qureshi who said jab jab desh mein chunav aata hai garib ke pet mein pulav aata hai political parties spend a lot of money during elections as well so ultimately it is the poor downtrodden sections of the society who get to earn as well during this frequent election process it's difficult to find a suitable time slot india is a vast country it's also a diverse country geographically diverse linguistically diverse religiously diverse climatically diverse which time slot can we choose where the entire population of this country would find is find it easy to go to a polling booth and to cast her vote at the peak of the winter at the peak of the summer monsoon what would be the ideal time to choose for simultaneous elections in geographically vast countries such as india that's another challenge and the challenge all these challenges are the arguments given by the critics who are against the idea of one nation one election these are the arguments against these are the arguments in favor this topic is over clear let's look at another article a case of established law lagging behind new tech now what has happened there is an important case ongoing the case is open ai microsoft is being sued by new york times open ai which runs chat gpt you should be aware of it the principal investor in open ai is microsoft microsoft and open ai are being sued by new york times for copyright infringement what do we mean by that listen to me carefully you are asking me a question sir on what grounds is the vice president of india removed from his office you are asking me this question i am answering there are no specific grounds mentioned in the constitution no grounds mentioned how am i able to answer this question because i have been fed some information i have read subhash kashyap constitution of india dd basu lakshmi kant other books vn shukla so it is this sort of knowledge base which has fed me information that's how i am able to answer now look at generative pre trained transformers they are basically fed information and that is how they are able to resolve your queries answer your questions but this information is fed to this transformer to what sources can be copyrighted material as well new york times alleges that our articles our paid articles have been used by open ai to train its transformer and when the results are published the result is verbatim word by word line by line 
the same article of New York Times is published by Chat GPT, which basically means that we will lose our revenue. People will not subscribe to New York Times. We will lose our ad revenue. We will lose our subscription. You should stop this. You have to give us compensation. And you have to seek our permission. This is copyright infringement because you are using our content to train your transformer without giving us compensation, without seeking our permission. And how this case pans out is decided will have far reaching ramifications in the entire world because AI today has the power to disrupt world. Disrupt. How? Let's say we are feeding music. Music, classical music, Hindustani music, Carnatic music, Western music, hip hop, jazz, whatever. And then this system will generate unique music. What will happen to our composers? This system will be fed images, paintings of the world class painters, and then it will generate its unique paintings. What will happen to our painters? So it has the potential to disrupt the world. And that is why this case is worth to be followed. But we need to understand from the civil services examination point of view, something else. Is there a similar case in India? Are you aware of any similar case in India on copyright infringement? Oxford University Press Cambridge University Press and various other publishers, they sued Rameshwari Copy, Rameshwari Copy House, it is a photocopy Xerox shop inside Delhi School of Economics. What it used to do, it used to provide course packs at 50 paisa per page. What is a course pack? You are asking me, sir, you are teaching polity. Yes. Is there a single book that I can refer to for the civil services examination? I would say no. Lakshmi Kant is important for prelims, but may not be important for mains. For mains, you will have to go through D.D. Basu, V.N. Shukla, you have to look at some of the websites as well. You have to look at newspapers, the Hindu, Indian Express as well. What if I make a course pack, I take information from Lakshmikant, D.D. Basu, various other sources, the Hindu, Indian Express as well, and start selling it? Will it not be copyright infringement? That's exactly what Rameshwari Copy was doing. Whatever books professors were recommending the students, along with their page numbers, multiple books, different page numbers, those course packs used to be created by Rameshwari Copy, which basically means he would take all those page numbers, Xerox them, give a course pack, selling it at 50 paisa per page to the students. And now Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press and others they approached the Delhi High Court saying, please stop this. This is copyright infringement. 309 authors. Some of them were working with these publications. They requested, wrote an open letter to these publishers saying, don't pursue this case because this is for students, for the welfare of the students. This is for what they call fair use. Authors such as Ramachandra Guha, Pratap Banu Mehta, Partha Chatterjee, all of them, they wrote a letter to these publications saying don't do that because the students are using this for fair use, not for commercial gains. Ultimately, Delhi High Court imposed an injunction saying Rameshwari photocopy, you should not sell these course packs because it is copyright infringement. There was a temporary relief given to these publications. 
But later on, the Delhi High Court said these course packs are allowed because all of this is done for fair use. Fair use in the sense that means this copyrighted material you can use for fair use. What is that fair use? We have a Copyright Act of 1957. We have copyright rules of 2013, according to which the teacher, when he is instructing the students, I can use this copyright material because this is for student benefit. The student, when he or she is writing answers to the questions given, the students can cite these copyrighted material as well. Why? Because it is for fair use. It is not for commercial gain. And ultimately, this case was rejected. And ultimately, Mahesh Rameshwari photocopy was allowed to sell these course packs. This case is entirely based upon fair use. Because if Chat GPT is not allowed copyright material to train its algorithm, then we will see the death of AI. But at the same time, this column argues that maybe there will be out of court settlement in this case. Even then, it will have a far reaching ramifications. For the civil services examination, you should also look at Burn Convention. What Berne Convention does, it allows the governments that you can pass laws and through these laws, you can also allow the printing, the publishing of copyrighted material if it is for fair use. So Berne Convention, this Rameshwari copy case, uh, the Copyright Act, the copyright rules and this larger debate on AI versus copyright infringement becomes very important for your examination, particularly important if you are appearing in the interviews. Clear? Let's look at another article. New Delhi has bridged psychological gap with the Northeast, says Home Minister Mr. Amit Shah. And he was participating in Northeastern Council meeting. Before 1956, the entire country was categorized into Part A, Part B, Part C, Part D territories. Part A consisted of states which were previously under Governor General. For example, Bombay, Madras, big states. Part B, those areas which were previously princely states. For example, Hyderabad, Jammu and Kashmir. Part C, which were previously under chief commissioners. For example, Delhi, Kurg. And in Part D, we had one territory known as Andaman and Nicobar Islands. But there was a demand that the state should be reorganized on linguistic lines. Language should be the basis of reorganizing the state. And you might have read about the agitation launched by Poti Sri Ramulu in Andhra, where he wanted all the Telugu speaking areas to be clubbed together to create Andhra as a linguistic state. And in October 1953, Andhra became the first linguistic state in independent India, cowed out specifically on the grounds of language. And that is how the State's Reorganization Act was passed in the year 1956 which allowed, which provided for the reorganization of the states on the grounds of language. Then this part A, B, C, D differentiation was done away with. The entire country was reorganized into 14 states and six union territories. So after this reorganization act, part A, B, C, D ceased to exist. The entire country was reorganized into 14 states and six union territories. Who was the Prime Minister? Pandit Nehru. What Pandit Nehru said? Although we have created states in the name of language, but we should also ensure that these states are grouped into four or five zones. And these four or five zones should have an advisory council 
so that these states in that zone will have the habit of cooperating with each other. And that is how the idea of zonal councils emerged. So then five zonal councils were created. Northern, Eastern, Western, Southern and Central zonal councils were created. And you need to understand that all these zonal councils are statutory bodies. That means these bodies are created by the law passed by the parliament, by a statute, by the law, statutory bodies. But this Northeastern Council, is it a statutory body? Yes. But is it created under the States Reorganization Act? No. Northeastern Council was created by a separate act, separate law known as North Eastern Council Act of 1972. Which are the states part of this Northeastern Council? We have Seven Sisters and Sikkim. Seven Northeastern states and Sikkim, they are part of Northeastern Council. These facts are important for your prelims examination. Who is the chairman of the Zonal Council? Chairman is the Home Minister. Who is the Deputy Chairman of the Zonal Council? Chief Minister by rotation. For one year. Chief Minister by rotation means if it's a Northeastern Council, Chairman will be the Home Minister, Deputy Chairman or Vice Chairman would be, for example, the Chief Minister of Assam for one year. Then next year, it will be the Chief Minister of Arunachal Pradesh. That means by rotation, all the members of this council will become Deputy Chairman or Vice Chairman. That's what you need to understand regarding these zonal councils. Okay? Let's look at something else. 19 children to get Rashtriya Bal Puraskar. On Monday, Pradhan Mantri Rashtriya Bal Puraskar. It is an annual award given by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. Annual award given by Ministry of Women and Child Development. To whom? Children. In the age group of 5 to 18. For what? For exceptional abilities and outstanding achievements. But in what areas? Seven categories. For bravery, art and culture, environment, innovation, science and tech, social service and sports. Because these areas, they deserve national recognition. Each awardee is given a medal, a certificate and a citation booklet. If the award is given today, invitations, applications are invited from the states that if you have somebody to recommend for Bal Puraskar, please give your suggestions. And any act, any outstanding achievement which happened two years before the nomination, those are considered for award. Long story short, this Pradhan Mantri Bal Puraskar Award. Puraskar is an award. This Pradhan Mantri Rashtri Bal Puraskar. It is basically given to children in the age group of 5 to 18, those who have done something extraordinary in these seven areas. But this act should have been done within two years of the nomination. If you look at Press Information Bureau, it mentions seven categories bravery, science and tech, environment, innovation. But if you look at the Hindu newspaper, it mentions six categories. Environment as a category is missing. If you look at the Press Information Bureau report of last year, if you look at the website as well, it also talks about six categories, not environment. It basically refers to scholastic as a category involving environment and science and technology. 
So keep in mind, you should consider it six is the category, number of categories in which it is awarded. Although PIB says seven. Done? Let's look at the last article. How do you plan to save the great Indian bustard? Supreme Court asks the government. This is the great Indian bustard. It is mentioned under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Act of 1972, which basically means hunting is not allowed unless and until there is a threat to human life. unless and until suffering from sickness which is beyond recovery. Anybody who hunts this great Indian bustard, it's a criminal activity because this bird is under schedule one of the Wildlife Protection Act. In fact, the trade in great Indian bustard is also prohibited. And in the IUCN red list, the status of Great Indian Bustard is critically endangered. Facts, very, very important for your examination. The Great Indian Bustard is categorized by, if you look at the, how it looks, there is a black crown and then there is a pale neck and head. Can you distinguish between a male Great Indian Bustard and a female Great Indian Bustard? Mostly no. Why? Because both male and female, they grow to the same height, they grow to the same weight as well. But the male has much bigger black crown. So if it was a male, the crown would have been slightly bigger. The black crown would have been slightly bigger. That's how you can distinguish between a male and a female Great Indian Bustard. Great Indian Bustard is the state bird of Rajasthan. Another important fact. In fact, there is a national park in Jaisalmer where efforts are being made to preserve, save the great Indian bustards. In fact, if you look at the population, there are 150 great Indian bustards found in Rajasthan. And this 150 is the 95% of the world population. Where do we find great Indian bustards in India? We find in Rajasthan. We also find it in Gujarat. Some great Indian bustards have also been spotted in Karnataka, the Belari district of Karnataka, in Maharashtra, as well as in Andhra Pradesh. Another fact, these great Indian bustards, they breed during the monsoon season. Okay, But there is a grave threat to great Indian bustards. Where is this threat coming from? Threat is Number one, killing. Poaching of great Indian bustard. That's number one. Number two, loss of habitat. Is another threat. Another threat. Collisions with 
फास्ट मूविंग कार्स passing through the areas protected areas as well as collisions with the biggest threat to the great indian buster is the collision with high tension electric wires and that is exactly what supreme court is asking the government how are you able to ensure that these busters they don't collide with the fast moving vehicles and the high tension electric wires in the protected areas because on the pattern of project tiger which was launched in 1973 in 2012 project buster was also launched with specific focus in jaisalmer one more interesting thing is that similar to great indian buster you might have heard of I'll mention it here. Hobara Buster. Which is mostly found in Pakistan. The Pakistani Supreme Court banned the killing, the poaching of Hobara Buster. But do you know who was the biggest hunter of these Hobara Busters in Pakistan? royal princes of saudi and gulf countries and why would they hunt hobara bustard hunted for meat why would they hunt it for meat because it was an aphrodisiac which basically means food drink which stimulates sexual desires pakistani supreme court banned the poaching the killing the hunting of hobara buster but later on the government allowed it for the saudi princes why because the government said this is our to further our foreign policy that is how sometimes the saudi princes the princes the rich wealthy gulf princes they come in a chartered flights taking these hobara busters taking falcons as well because it is a pakistan's foreign policy to please the royal princes even if it means killing the endangered hobara buster done let's look at two questions for your mains examination preparation one one nation one election may weaken indian democracy critically analyze so you will have to write arguments in favor of one nation one election arguments against as well then give your conclusion both pros and as well as cons you will have to mention in this answer the zonal councils provide an excellent forum where irritants between center and states and among states can be resolved to free and frank discussions and consultations discuss the role of zonal councils in furthering a spirit of cooperative federalism in india please write answers to these questions and if you have enjoyed today's session do not forget to press the like button drop in your comments subscribe to our youtube channel if you haven't yet share the links of these classes with your friends and fellow aspirants and do not forget to register for the upcoming workshop on january 27 at 7 pm on an academy thank you for watching have a great day ahead bye bye